two writers, one just starting out, the other a bestseller. Join James Blatch and Mark Dawson and their amazing guests as they discuss how you can make a living telling stories. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Yes, hello and welcome to the Self-Publishing Formula podcast with James and Mark on a uh, Friday. Uh, broadcasting here from the United Kingdom around the world to our loyal and wonderful SPF community. It is uh, what a great community of 99.9% supportive, lovely people. 95.6%. <laughs> yes. Oh, very, very rarely do we get a... Very rarely, Anybody yeah, who's, uh, throws their toys out of the pram. But um, uh, I know I, as a struggling writer... I think I moved on from aspiring to struggling. Um, really appreciate the support I get. And, and yeah, I get a little bit of geeing up and pushing on, um, particularly from Sasha Black at LBF, who made me shake hands and set a date. Um, but generally, people just have sympathy. They want to know, uh, you know what your issues are, and you talk about stuff, you talk about their writing, and people just want each other to get on and be successful. Now, aren't that many industries... I mean, they're, on the face of it, actors are all supportive of each other, but they all hate each other and they become incredibly jealous when someone's successful. That's a slight generalisation, but I don't genuinely feel in, in our industry people want each other to be successful, and I really appreciate that. Yeah, no, I, I think so too. It's always been a fairly collaborative, friendly um, uh, industry and yeah, one I enjoy being a part of. Just before we go on, in case people can hear, I've had to move offices today, so I'm in the front of the two offices that I kind of do my work out of and I'm right next door to a quite busy road so you may you may get a little bit of traffic noise rumbling across as we as we do the podcast today you're in the south wing <clears throat> we can hear a little bit of traffic noise but that's absolutely fine good okay look we've got a few things uh, to start with uh, one of the things we want to do is a patreon update just to welcome our latest patreon uh, supporters you can support this podcast if you go to patreon.com forward slash spf podcast and we want to say a very warm welcome to jamie ferguson from boulder colorado from Elaine Bateman from Solihull in the West Midlands here in the UK, uh, to Gillian Churick, um, who I think it says in brackets Barbara Gaskell Denville, I suspect is her author name, from Victoria in Australia, uh, Gillian Duff from Angus in Scotland, isn't Angus a great town name for Scotland, and from Dragana Muntik, Munitic, Dragana Munitic. Apologies. Well, talking of apologies, I am going to apologize. To apolog- apologise to Niney <laughs> Hammond, <laughs> yeah, to the English language, to Niney <laughs> Hammond, who for some years now we have called Ninny, and uh, Niney, you have. I have, I have. Niney is a um, a very early member of the SPF community. I think she may have been one of the founder purchasers of uh, Ads for Authors, the Ads for Authors course, um, and Niney's uh, been very supportive and is a Patreon member. And I welcomed her in traditional fashion by mispronouncing her name, Ninny. And um, I'm here to correct it. So, Niney, you're very welcome. Thank you for being a part of us. And thank you for supporting us on Patreon. It makes a big difference to Mark and me. Okay, Mark, let's have a few updates from you. We are. We should say this is a masterclass episode, so there's no interview. The interview is effectively with Mark, who's going to bring us up to date on what we need to know about Facebook, Facebook advertising. There's been quite a few changes in that area uh, and a little bit of a mix-in with um, some headline news that's gone around the world on, on bits, and there's always a bit of a, a flurry of panicky emails and posts that go around when these things happen, but Mark's going to set the record straight and calm nerves, I think, today. Uh, but before we do that, let's just talk about you your own career, Mark, because you've had an interesting year, to say the least, uh, after a fairly big decision to go to KU, go back into exclusive with uh, with Amazon. And I think it's fair to say you haven't looked back, but you can update us on that. Uh, And your latest book, Redeemer, number 12, I think, in the Milton series. Yeah, that's right. So that came out on the 1st of May. So um, I've had about, as we recall, this is the 21st. So I've had 21 days of sales on that book. And it's been a really successful launch. Um, for the first time, actually, I did um, a, a pre-order. Um, so I don't normally launch with pre-orders, but I decided to give it a try. It was a wide launch to start with. So the first, the book is everywhere at the moment. Um, eventually, it will probably go into KU. But yeah, I, I ran pre-orders across all platforms. And um, just the Amazon sales, I just checked. I, I, this doesn't include Apple, Kobo, Barnes & Noble, which have also been quite good. Um, but... It sold just a touch over 5,700 copies um, at the time of um, this podcast. 
and has brought in just shy of thirty thousand dollars. So it's it's been a very strong launch, um, stronger than the last one, I think. Um, I haven't checked that properly, but I think it's stronger than the last one, and that should now um, be set for fairly consistent sales you know, for the rest, maybe for the rest of the year. I mean, the, the last two Milton books, the Alamo and Blackout, still sell between 30 and 40 copies a day um, and have been consistent sales all the way since they were released last year. So this one has has started off a little better than both of those, which should hopefully mean that it's, it's consistent for uh, good sales for the rest, the rest of the year, certainly. That's fantastic. And in terms of, um, of Kindle Unlimited, uh, you've uh, you've posted some of your figures into the group so far. Um, you're still happy with the decision you made there? Yeah, I was extremely happy. I, I just about to just check what the current state of play is, but I think it's something like four hundred thousand dollars this this year, just in terms of Amazon sales. Um, so that that doesn't include other platforms. Some books are still available um, everywhere, and doesn't include things like print, um, audio books, and, and that kind of stuff. So on track for a seven figure year this year, which would be pretty astonishing, really. Um, and yeah, really, really pleased with how it's gone. I mean, I've, I've, I've been very, very pleased with the response that it's had um, from readers. And I haven't had too many, in fact, I've had very, very few um, emails from readers. And there we go. There goes my uh, book report when chime. You're, when you're in Mark's office, yeah, the book report. Very appropriate. Um, I haven't had too many um, emails from readers complaining that they couldn't get it. So that that's that's one, one of the things I was very worried about. But it hasn't really happened yet. So... Yeah, I mean, it's not for everyone. As I always say, this is, um, I'm, I'm a big supporter of the other platforms. Um, yeah. And um, KU is not for everyone, for sure. Um, but it, it's worth looking into. Certainly, it's a viable option. And it's been it's been good for me. Yeah. And in our sort of more official training on this, you do um, talk, exclu- you talk extensively about both exclusive and uh, wide and the pros and cons and allow people to make their own decision. I did see we had an email this week, somebody confused thinking, you've always recommended going wide, why are you now in KU? But actually that's not been the case. You've always said, these have been my decisions. And at the time you did the course, you were wide, but you still explained the pros and cons of both. And just because exclusive is working for you does not mean it works for other people. No, absolutely not. And yeah, there are there are plenty of issues with KU at the moment with um, uh, page counts being apparently unilaterally um, cut um, and people getting um, flagged for suspicious account promotion activity when you know, they say that nothing suspicious was done. So that it, there are issues. Amazon has a difficult line to follow with this. With I mean, KU has been um, attacked by scammers, and Amazon is constantly trying to stay in touch with the scammers to try and shut them down. But these are, you know, clever people. Amazon cl- closes one loophole and they open an- another one. So Amazon is always trying to chase them. Um, and there, there have been authors who've been caught up in, in that situation. So yeah, it's, that's another thing to just bear in mind. Um, and just you take all these things into account when you make your own decision. But, you know, I, I'm agnostic about how you sell books. The, the bottom line is I just want to get my books into the hands of as many readers as possible. And if I can pay the mortgage at the same time, then, you know, everyone's happy. Um, so, yeah, but it's, it's something for everyone to think about. I'm think hoping- about when, when your book's ready, we'll decide what we're going to do with yours. Yes, big decision. Um, mm. Big when as well. Uh, I hope a million dollars a year does help pay your mortgage. It should... Um- <laughs> Should make well, I've just moved house. Yeah, you have got a big house. Uh, and just one final note on that, because um, you talk about the revenue. What sort of advertising spend are you on at the moment? Yeah, about 10%, um, between 10 and 15%, I think, at the moment. So, yeah, I must have touched more than that, between 10 and 20%. I, I think last month um, I played about $100,000 and spent about $20,000 on advertising. So it's it's in that kind of ratio. Press a, T- trending a touch down now, but it, it will be in that ballpark. So you're looking at maybe two hundred thousand dollars spend on on uh, something like that. Yeah, 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 it'll be in that ballpark. Yeah. We'll talk about. I mean, the, the places I'm spending, Facebook and Amazon, chiefly. We'll, we'll you know we can talk about at least the former um, in in today's episode. Okay. Well, one more thing just to touch on before we go into the masterclass uh, fully, uh, which is GDPR. So last week we uh, had our GDPR episode. I think it might rank as one of the most uh, downloaded episodes we've ever had. I think it probably will end up there because it's a it's a key issue. I've had lots and lots of conversations and discussions with people about GDPR. 
Um, and I'm currently doing it for a couple of small organisations that I do some voluntary work for at the moment because everyone's um, obviously affected by this. Uh, there is, without question, and one of my uh, friends is a very senior IT guy with a large um, music industry company, global music industry company, to remain nameless. And uh, he likens this very much to the Y2K area so there is a, a lot more panic an unjustified mm. amount of panic can, can next to really w what changes are there um mm. and it's not going to be the end of the world in a couple of days time on the 25th uh, of may um but uh first of all i think our, our web our podcast by design or accident did the right thing and that it exposed the areas that you need to think about it gave people information but what it didn't say is a very kind of one zero one zero which is, you are getting a little bit of that and the people are saying you definitely need to email your whole list uh, to get them to stay on so uh, hopefully that episode is the right one we've had lots of very positive feedback about that so thank you very much indeed and i hope you're you're plotting your own way through that um we got anything to add on GDPR at the moment? We should we should say that that PDF is a, a very useful bit of paper. We should um, just let people know again that if you've missed the episode, I would really listen to it from last week. And you go then to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash GDPR and you can download not only, there's three parts really. There's the legal advice that we got, we paid for a few thousand uh, pounds, few thousand dollars paid for, which you get for free. Um, which is quite conservative, I say, with a small c. It's a lawyer's interpretation. You've got our interpretation, which is a little bit more looser and more specifically around uh, authors and what's going to be most efficient, we think, for you. Uh, caveated that it's our interpretation. And finally, there's a privacy policy, which is GDPR compliant, which you're happy to uh, copy, paste and, and adapt uh, for the future. Yeah, so... Um Nothing really much to, to add on to that. Just, I mean, my inbox continues to be flooded with emails from everyone about do I want to stay on on their lists, which, you know, is, as, as we've suggested, not really necessary and might even, in some cases, be in breach of the regulations, which is all quite amusing. The, um, I mean, the story is, is a big one now. It's covered in the BBC not too long ago. It's been in all the uh, national newspapers over here because everyone is getting these emails. It isn't, it isn't a case of just a few people. We're all getting dozens of emails from the lists that we signed up to and forgot about 10 years ago. Um, but the more I the more I think about it, I'm still fairly relaxed about it. Um, the I think the important thing, just to kind of reiterate what we said in the episode, was um, just think about consent. You know, you put yourself in the position of a subscriber to your list. Are you being completely transparent as to what they are signing up for? Um, does you know? Are you making it clear that in, in addition to a free book, you are going to add them to the mailing list? That's that's kind of the main thing, really. And and then also with that in mind, just look back at your um, your mailing list sources, sources of subscribers, and just think: was that consent clear um, at the time they signed up? And I've done that with mine, and and all of mine are double opt in, um, and always have been. The only ones I'm not confident about are Insta freebie signups, um, and that's because. There have been some issues with, with not issues really, but just how Insta Freebie often added people. That this was the way that the platform worked, and that it wasn't necessarily clear that you were joining a mailing list in addition to getting your free book. So, well, I think it's now. I don't know when they changed it, but I checked this yeah. recently for us. I think it is now a separate checkbox because we, if I go into yeah. our Insta Freebie account, there are two lists. There's, there's the ones who opted into receiving emails from the author, and ones who didn't, who who got the book without opting in. So that must be clear. Yeah, now. yeah. Just I mean, just the question of going in and looking into. It. I know that some there have been quite a few comments in the uh, in our Facebook group about people who are not comfortable with with that that source. And one thing to add to that is, I mean, even with say if you can segment your um, subscribers who've come from a place like insta freebie if you're not confident about those the consent or, or did they know what they're signing up for something like mailchimp will enable you to select us or non-eu subscribers and just take them out of they're, they're not relevant to the equation if they're only relevant if they're in the eu gdpr doesn't doesn't cover us subscribers so even in that worst case scenario say you've got two thousand people on an insta freebie list maybe only 400 of them are in the EU, and those are the only ones that you really need to be concerning yourself about. So yeah. don't don't throw the baby out with the bathwater when, when you're cleaning your lists like this. No, absolutely. Well, you can still um, post your questions into our community group, some good sources of information in there and people weighing in with their uh, experiences. Uh, and one person who's become a little bit <clears throat> jaded and deluded by, deluded? Deluded, or jaded, I'll just go with that, uh, about this whole GDPR 
uh, fracas uh, is Kevin Partner, who's uh, another uh, long-time and very uh, welcome member of the SPF community. And uh, Kevin, I think, was getting a bit fed up having to firefight on on uh, in the Facebook group for people who are you know, throwing their arms up in the air and panicking about it unnecessarily. And he suddenly had this idea that he wanted to do something positive uh, in the whole GDPR area. Uh, so I think Kevin, for a living, develops WordPress sites, and he's been going through and adding the cookie bar and privacy policy to lots of his client sites. So uh, he's recorded a 10-minute video of doing that so that people who manage their own WordPress sites, I know lots of you have WordPress uh, author-based websites, uh, you can follow that video and you can then upload, you can update the cookie bar and upload your uh, update your privacy policy to be GDPR compliant, just following along with that video. And what he wants to do, Kevin, is for anybody who gets that video, uh, you do that in return for making a donation to the uh, Tommy, I'm going to get Tommy's surname right, you know how to pronounce Tommy's surname. Don Bavand. Don Bavand, yeah. Slightly unusual name. Now, Tommy is... Um, uh, fighting uh, pretty late stage cancer at the moment, uh, doing brilliantly. He's a wonderful uh, human being who has a, a great, uh, courageous way of taking on this this illness, which is really dilapidating it, him at the moment. But we uh, we we touch every bit of wood around here, hoping that Tommy's going to get through. But the Just Giving campaign has been set up. We've mentioned it before. So there is a link. Uh, actually right at the top of our community Facebook group. So if you're not already a member, why are you not a member of our Facebook group? You need to go to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash SPF secret group or just search for self-publishing community, uh, self-publishing formula community on Facebook. And it's the pinned post right at the top from Kevin Partner. And you will see all the details there. So there's a post uh, link to the Just Giving page for Tommy. And then you will get the video sent to you after making your donation. So thank you, Kevin, for doing that. And that is a very useful video. I've watched the video myself. We don't operate a word. I don't touch WordPress sites. John Dyer does that. But it's a very good step-by-step -step, uh, instructional video. Very much in line with what we do here at SPF, which is to teach people how to do things themselves. Great. Kevin, thank you very much indeed for that. Okay, so that's GDPR, uh, hopefully for now. The actual D-Day is uh, four days away as we speak at the moment. Is it actually going to be Friday? Is that the day this podcast goes out? It could be. Yeah, it could be. I think it is. I think it's Friday. So there you go. Let's not panic about that anymore. Right. Facebook. So Facebook has changed quite a lot. Uh, it does, obviously, they tweak and they tinker. But one of the bigger changes that happened over the last year, and I say year, it's slightly fluid because it got rolled out slowly, uh, was the end of the Power Editor. Now, we should say when you initially wrote the course and you taught, you said people to people not to use the Ads Manager because it wasn't sophisticated enough, but to use the Power Editor where you could really optimize uh, your campaigns and tweak them. And then uh, Facebook did what actually looks like a fairly sensible thing which is not to have two competing platforms slightly different but to create an all singing dancing ads manager yeah it was always coming uh, it, it had been rumored for two or three years but the um power editor was retired um when would it have been maybe six or seven months ago and it is it's well it rolls out slowly so that not everyone has the the new um ads manager at the same time which is always very difficult when you're doing a course um, and you're trying to teach people how to use a platform, and you don't know exactly what version of the platform they're looking at when when they're trying to follow along. But it, it's that's all happened now. It's finished. The power editor has been uh, depreciated, so you can't get it anymore, and everything runs off the new ads manager. And um, one of the things we do with the course is um, if that if you have fundamental changes like that, and then we record all of the content again um, so that it's up to date. So content is up to date, um, and it does now reflect the, uh, the fact that you don't need to use the Power Editor. Uh, people were worried about that. People who, you know, I was a bit worried about it. I, I taught myself how to use a Power Editor, became very familiar with it, um, knew how to do everything I need to do quickly and efficiently. Um, but... Uh, had a you know a few nerves about um, losing that and moving on to a new interface, but they they were misplaced. It's very very simple. The the ads manager is sophisticated now. It's uh, it's easy to do everything that you used to do with Power Editor, um, and also you don't need to jump into a different interface when you want to check your metrics or um, to or to um, modify campaigns. It's all um, under the same under the same dashboard. So much, much easier to do that and certainly nothing to worry about. But um, you know, we, we occasionally get people um, saying that they don't understand how to use the interface, but it, it is it is pretty straightforward now. 
Yeah, good. I think it looks good as well, the new ads manager. So um, another thing then, so there's been every now and again, there's a bit of publicity about a change that either Facebook makes or more recently, and we'll move on to this one latterly, um, something that's affected Facebook externally in, uh, in, in the way that the ads platform and the uh, organic reach has been used. Now, one of those changes that Facebook made is they tweaked the way that uh, pages were reaching people's posts from pages, which are effectively businesses. And uh, we have all, all the pages. It's we have got to have one, haven't you, to run your ads platform. So you must have one. Uh, how the posts from there reached into people's uh, timelines organically, as opposed to posts from groups. Um, and of course, as opposed from posts from other personal accounts. And again, there was a kind of, you know, some area of panic about this, saying that that's the end of it. We, you know, Facebook party's over. We won't be able to promote our businesses on Facebook. But that's not quite what they were trying to do and, and, and isn't quite what they've done. No, I mean, they've been re reducing um, reach for a long time. So, it, it, you know, five or six years ago, you'd have really wide reach. You're, you're, you know, whether you're, let's kind of put personal profiles aside for the minute. They're not really relevant to what we're doing. But you, when you set up a, a business page, an author page, and you try to reach your um, readers, the reach would have been much, much higher than it, it is these days. It would also have been free. So um, Facebook, you know, golden age, probably five years ago for free organic reach, very easy to reach lots and lots of your readers at no cost. Now, that's obviously was never going to be sustainable. Facebook is a business. It's, it's, um, it's there to... Um, to make money for its shareholders, and and they once they built the platform up to a significant um, size, it was fairly obvious that they were going to switch on um, the you know, the functionality that you have to pay in order to reach the same number of people, and it's been something that has um, reach has been um, declining organically for the last three or four years, and it has got to a stage now where it's very very low. So if you were to just pop into a post on your Facebook page. Um, announcing your new book and you did no spend on that at all, it would have a minimal reach. Uh, it's all, I wouldn't say it's not worth doing, but it certainly will will lead to not as many people as, as would previously have heard about it. So bearing all that in mind, and th this has caused a bit of a fuss. I mean, I've seen some um, some fairly well-known internet marketers. There's one in particular I won't name, um, but uh, he, he has one or two million followers on his uh, Facebook page, thank you, uh, book report again. Um, and he um, posted a bit of a rant about how Facebook was screwing him. He'd built this page up and, he, you know, he, and no one was, and now he was basically saying that they were blackmailing him because he couldn't, he had to pay to reach the people that he'd paid to, to build on the page. Um, and the guy who runs the SPF um, advertising. So I don't do the advertising anymore for the SPF side of things. We've got a guy called Deepesh who does it for us. He's been on the podcast before, knows more about Facebook ads than I do. Um, and he uh, he posted to this guy and said, look, you know, you need to be moving to groups. You, you, pages don't work. All you have to pay. And um, this guy reacted quite badly. And um, it, was, it was actually being racist, which was uh, was all very unpleasant. Um but the point is, uh, as Deepesh tried to explain to him, is that there are other ways to, to achieve the same effect. You just need to be prepared to uh, learn what the changes are and then adapt to them. So the simplest way, uh, there's two ways really. And the first way is to, is to understand that you are now, um, you, you will have to pay to reach uh, the same number of people again. But that's fine. If you learn how to do it properly, it's still a very, very profitable platform to use. And obviously that's what the course teaches or, or the Facebook module of the Ads for Authors course. The other way to do it um, is to move to groups. So um, Facebook groups have, have also been around for quite a long time, but they have, at the moment, um, a, a bigger organic reach than pages do, at least in, in my experience. So what I've done is I've set up um, the, I think it's called All Thriller No Filler, the Mark Dawson Readers Group. And that's connected to my page. Um, there's a post on my page, probably pinned most of the time, that directs people to join the group. They, it's a secret, it's kind of a closed group, so they need to apply to join, just the same as the uh, the Facebook community that we have. People apply, um, I, um, I add them in, um, they get added in, or I get my VA to add them in. And as soon as they are on board, they, uh, they then um, get the messages that, that I put out a little bit more easily, and I don't have to pay to do that. Um, and you can have groups upon groups. So one thing I'm doing next month, I'm 
perhaps do a podcast on this a bit later on, but I'm going to be doing a book club. So it's kind of read through the Milton books with me in real time, one a month. Um, so this will be a way to drive sales on the first in the series and then the second in the series, etc. And I will answer questions. I'll tell people why we have blog posts, Facebook videos, um, what I was thinking when I wrote the books. Um, and I'm running that one, the first one, through a, a new group just dedicated to The Cleaner, which is the first book in the series. And that has a pretty good organic reach. So that's a, it's a, a pretty good way now to uh, get around the fact that organic reach is declining, is to start to move towards groups. Um, you're starting to see that now with other people getting into that space, and I would recommend that for authors as well. Okay. So is it fair to summarise and say that your, a page is something that you need to to engage in Facebook business side of things, but the page should be looked at as that, the platform for you to run your ads campaigns and a little bit else. A group is somewhere where you can build a fan base and reach people more easily, um, and you shouldn't rely on the page for that. Yeah, kind of, yeah. I mean, the, the, the page is still worth having for the, the limited organic reach that it has, um, but I would say, generally speaking, most of my contact these days is through the group, so yeah, okay. you, will, you will need the page to advertise, but I'd also I'd start to look at having a group as well. Uh, and also, think to be fair to Facebook, I mean, you did say at the beginning that, um, you know, they're a business and ultimately they're going to reduce how much you can do for free as a business. Um, another side of this, and I genuinely believe them, is that they, they had an eye on what the person experience, the user experience was like in Facebook. And it was getting to a point where you would have these newspaper quizzes or links from newspapers or media groups or HuffPo or whoever it was filling up your timeline. And they quite easily found you through your interests promoted from their page. And what Facebook wanted to get back to was posts from your friends and family being the dominant thing that you saw there and the things that you had said you were interested in and taken part in. So for instance, if one of my friends and I are both members of a group and I post into the group or they post into the group, I will get that notification about that. But that's what Facebook's fine about because we both are active in that group. What it doesn't want us is having the timeline filled with rather generic corporate stuff when really it should be you know, photographs of our friend's dinner or whatever yeah, it is. That's and, right. and that was part, that was the fundamentals. They, at least that's what they said it was about. And that does appear to have worked to me. Yeah, I think that was one of the, the motivations behind it. But I mean, one thing, to, you know, as we, we're recording this in May, um, next May, I would be very surprised if, if we can't advertise into groups. So, um, you know, people would be able to advertise to my reader group. Um, I think that's quite likely. Um, and it might well be that reach in groups goes down. Um, so this is a, is a constantly evolving um, sphere for us. And, but, you know, if that happens, then there'll be another opportunity that, w that we'll be moving people towards. So, it's just, you know, keep, keep subscribing to the podcast. Yeah. Keep this when, when we find things out, um, we, we pass them on. So in, in a few months' time, there'll be an advert in your group saying, do you like Mark Dawson? You're going to love James Blatch. Yeah, well, that's, if you had a truth in advertising, James, that's, uh, <laughs> that is entirely possible. Okay. Hang on, are you, are you dating? When your book will need to be out for you to be advertising it. Well, I should say that uh, a few beers in to our London Book Fair um, uh, soiree, I did say that by London Book Fair next year, it will be published. There we go. Let's hold him accountable. <sighs> I think we may regret <laughs> saying that. Um, okay, uh, let's move on to engagement campaigns rather than lead generation. What do you mean by that? So, yeah, this is something that we're trying at the moment um, with SPF. So um, lead gen is still great for building your list. It's really convenient. It's, they're simple to set up. And more importantly, they're really simple for people to um, respond to and join your, your list. And we'll talk about them a little bit later on with regards to GDPR, because I think that, that's something that we didn't really touch up on last week or the week before when we, when we did GDPR. So we'll, we'll quickly talk about that. But something that uh, we're going back to, the old way of doing things um, was sending people to a landing page. Um, so we started to uh, test that with SPF, with the ads that we run. We run lots and lots of ads all the time for different things. So um, the new courses, um, the cover course with Stuart, um, the, the giveaway for GDPR, we've run some ads on that. So there's lots of things that we're always testing. And we've been finding that the cost to add someone to our subscription list, uh, the SPF list, is 
probably around about two pounds fifty, so around about three twenty five, three thirty dollars, something like that, which is much more expensive than it was two years ago when I was doing all these campaigns myself. It would we were probably looking at between one dollar or one fifty, something like that, to, to build a list in those days. So it's more expensive just generally. Um, that's just the way it is. And we're also fishing in a smaller pool now because we've we've you know, we've got a list of about ninety thousand authors. So one thing that we thought we'd test would be to just go back to that old um, method of running people to a, um, a landing page. And that has been working really well. And, and one wrinkle on that um, was we would start to run an engagement campaign, first of all. Now, what I mean by that is we would test our copy and our creative, um, our images, in an engagement campaign. So just uh, setting the uh, objective for engagement rather than uh, traffic or list building or whatever the other objectives we might look to use could be. Um, we'd be looking to get likes and, and shares and things like that. And by doing that, uh, we can work out quite easily which of the, which of the campaigns that are working the best, so which um, audiences are working, which uh, creative combinations are working. And then once we've got that, um, we've just um, used that information, turn a new campaign into uh, one that's uh, targeted for traffic, and then we send those, um, those clicks to a landing page rather than using lead gen. And by doing that, I mean, it's fluctuating all the time at the moment, and I just saw in, in our Slack group, um, this morning that the costs have gone up a little bit. But we were getting um, sign-ups that are around about 30 pence um, on um, Thursday and Friday. Um, those costs have gone up to around about 150 um, now, but that's still much cheaper than it has been with lead gen recently. So what I'm saying there is that this is this is a fairly advanced tactic. Um, and I'm not going to, you know, this isn't really the form for laying out uh, the kind of the full strategy in, in great depth. But what I want people to take away from this is that, um, things that worked in the past might now be working better again than they have been. And and more importantly than that, it, just to have an open mind and to think about testing and experimenting. Because if we hadn't um, gone with gone with this test, then we, we might have missed out on s some really interesting new opportunities that uh, you know, otherwise we, we would have missed. Okay, good. Very interesting uh, development uh, there. Um, let's move on to uh, Facebook in the news. It's had a relatively rough uh, ride this year the Cambridge Analytica story so Cambridge Analytica actually a company based just a few miles away from me here in the UK who um, definitely misused data we should but I mean, there's a lot I have to say um, I used to work for the BBC and I've got friends who are covering the story and no one has covered it very well it's very rare to read a newspaper or see a television article about this story and have the facts right, because people don't, frankly, the journalists don't understand it. But Cambridge Analytica at the first instance did effectively buy a bunch of uh, likes and contacts who took this quiz, and that was where they breached the terms. A lot of the other stuff they did actually was just using Facebook um, and using engagement. But the result of it is, even if people can't really explain why, People have taken a bit of a negative uh, take on Facebook. Now, some of that was repaired, I think, by Mark Zuckerberg's appearance um, at the Senate, where he was very calm and uh, very patient with people, again, who didn't seem to understand. I um, mean, one, one of them literally asked, how does Facebook make money then? Did you hear that question? And he said, we, we have adverts. And he goes, oh, yeah. Oh, interesting. You know, I mean, that was kind of the level where that discussion started. Um, but where do you think we are with Facebook? Can Facebook still, well, not can Facebook, is Facebook still trusted from a, an advertiser's point of view following this uh, scandal, if you want to call it that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think so. It's it's I, there's so much overreaction about this. Um, Facebook, you know, is is a learning platform. They're they're, they're still re relatively young in the in the grand scheme of things. It hasn't been around for a huge amount of time, and um, they they've built a massive um, platform, and with that comes lots of complicated issues that are very difficult to foresee. So. Um, and also, this, this, you know, the Analytica stuff came was only really relevant. The quiz that they were deploying to build up their um, uh, information on on subscribers was several years ago. Um, so you see all this kind of stuff in in the in the papers, and you you see the campaigns delete Facebook, all of that kind of stuff. Now I, we immediately got people in our Facebook group, who were all very meta, but um, they were going, "Oh, this is this is the end of Facebook advertising." Um, it won't work anymore. No one will see my ads, and I'm going to. You know, people will delete Facebook off their phones. Now, that's kind of gone quite quiet now, um, and it was fairly obvious that that was going to happen. People are so 
entrenched in Facebook's uh, ecosystem now. Not everyone, not so much the younger people, uh, but people, you know, kind of 25, 30 and up, I think well, maybe 30 and up. But you're, we're pretty much embedded now. And I, I wouldn't, I find it quite hard to imagine how I would, uh, how things would be without Facebook now. Um, other people may be you know, less in, involved than I am in terms of business and, and, and other other connections. But you, you haven't seen a, a mass exodus of people from Facebook um, and you haven't seen ads being any less effective. Um, clicks might be slightly more expensive than they used to be, but that's got nothing to do with this kind of stuff. It's, um, it, it's That's just the way it is. But I, I, people who are overreacting to this and, and, and claiming that it's the end of Facebook advertising and they need to find somewhere else to advertise their books, um, that they're overreacting. And if they want to get off the platform, that's absolutely fine. I, I, I wouldn't try to stop them because it just means that there'll be uh, cheap clicks for the people who stick around. So, um, you know, I, I think the, the takeaway, what I want to say with, with regards to this is kind of, it's something that I've said, you know, in previous um, points that we've covered today is just don't panic. Um, yeah. You know, the sky isn't falling. It's a big story for Facebook, but it shouldn't have too much of an effect on us like us. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the underlying things I think that happened during that period, uh, certainly with politicians, is there was a lot of talk about um, how Cambridge Analytica managed to influence or affect the uh, general election in the US, the presidential election. And the very fact that you're talking about one small group of people from one company potentially influencing or impacting um, a presidential election, whilst there was alarm and headlines and the company company's effectively been dissolved now and there may be prosecutions on the face of it, underneath it, politicians are saying to each other, wow, you know, really, is this where we are now that social media platforms can reach into people's lives and influence into that lot? This is the new world order. Social media is a very important thing. It's a huge foundation. And whilst ironing out some of the frailties of it <clears throat> and some of the flaws is a part and parcel of its growing, it's going, I completely agree with you, it's going nowhere. Yeah, exactly. And um, and rather than that, it's the opposite. It's getting bigger and bigger. So, um, yeah, don't panic. This, we should put, call this the don't panic episode. Don't panic, Mr. Mannery. Just like, just like GDPR, don't panic. Don't panic. Here's the don't panic. And the, of course, a lovely uh, touching reference to Douglas Adams. Uh, yeah. Finally, so in the list of uh, points that we wanted to raise, we're going to talk again GDPR. This is with particular uh, reference to lead gen ads. And you and I had a little discussion about this because I was a little bit misled, I think, at the time that I was recording it and all my research. And I'd read from Facebook them saying that they become the data controller with lead gen ads, which effectively they do because they they take the email address and they pass it. So as you're, if you're doing anything with the email address, you are the controller and that they had had satisfied their own privacy concerns with that. But of course, you write the copy. You write the thing that people are drawn in and clicking on. So that was important and you made that point last week. So you want to say, I think, a little bit more about uh, GDPR. Well, it's, a bit more, it's a bit more than that. I mean, it, you do need to do that, of course. And um, you need to... As someone who's owning the list and then processing the list yourself, you need to be completely clear that people have consented to, that they're able to give informed consent about what they're actually getting into. So um, there are lots of ways you can do that. You can put the, you could include copy in the ad itself, but that I think can be a bit unwieldy. Um, you know, it's, it's not going to, ads are going to look very, very unusual if you have an ad. So, you know, get my new book, open brackets, and also draw my main list, you know, the kinds of stuff that we, we mentioned uh, a couple of weeks ago. I think the better place to do it is actually when you're using lead gen is actually on the lead form itself. So if someone clicks on an ad and the lead form pops up, there are plenty of opportunities on that form where you can um, make it very clear uh, what they're signing up for. Um, if they haven't signed up at that point. They, they still haven't taken the decision to do so. They only do that when they click the, uh, the, the subscribe button. Um, and, just, you know, that's where your best practice should be. That is where you should have your privacy policy. It's Facebook, thank you, uh, there goes uh, <laughs> another few sales. Another um, 10,000. <laughs> Facebook gives you the uh, opportunity to link through to your privacy policy. And it is actually, it's not just an opportunity. It's, they kind of flag that you, you need to be doing that. So um, that is the, that's where you link to um, a policy like the one that we provided authors with um, in that handout um, 
selfpublishingformula.com forward slash GDPR. Um, you can uh, use your, you can cut and paste that, drop that onto your site and then um, have jamesblatch.com forward slash privacy. And that is where you would be, um, you'd be sending people. So it's, you know, it's really, what I'm saying here is just um, be really open either in your ad or on the lead form that it's not just a free book. It's, it's you know, use that wording that we, we've had a lawyer approved. Um, you can just pinch that if you want to. And we're reasonably confident, as confident as we can be at the moment, although, uh, you know, boringly, I'm not a lawyer. Um, just uh, use that wording if you want to. Uh, use the privacy policy. Make sure that everything is compliant. And you can either do that in the ad or my preference at the moment is on the lead form itself. Yeah. Good. Okay. <clears throat> well, one thing that we're going to report on in the future, so I've been doing this, uh, all the emails I've been getting from organizations saying, click here to stay on my list. Otherwise, that's it. Because of GDPR, you have to go, uh, which of course is largely nonsense. I'm not clicking any. And I'm taking this as an opportunity to mm-hmm. wind down how many emails I get in that particular folder. Yeah. And I am, I, I'm placing myself as one of the, I'm going to guess somewhere between 20 and 60 percent of people who want to be on the list but don't click because we know when you send an email to people you get open rates 25 percent is a good open rate 11 percent is not untypical you know people don't open every email and read every email and this is a really dangerous road to go down for commercial organizations they are going to end up and they may be doing it now there'll be panic in a lot of those organizations who've been misadvised at the beginning and they're now looking at potentially deleting 60% 60% of their list because they said, more. said to people Natural. more. Yeah, it could well be 80% of their list. More. I saw something in, in the newspaper today, um, and I think it was in The Guardian potentially. Um, it was 10% of people were clicking. Well, so, so using 90% of their mailing list. Well, that's the end of some businesses. And yeah. um, I, I've seen some pretty big names, even in our kind of sphere, of kind of digital Land marketing. Rover. Well, Land Rover, yeah, I've done I, it. I had Land Rover today. Oh, did you? Yeah. I mean, I've, I've had loads. And what are they actually going to do now, this week? Oh, I I, I, I'm expecting a slew of apology emails yeah, in, yeah. in the next couple of weeks saying we've taken advice from our lawyers again. It was clear to us that you had consented to be on our list, so thank you for staying, <laughs> or something like that. Yeah, wouldn't surprise I think it's me. quite likely. It's, it's very weird that the, um, the legislation intended to reduce email spam has multiplied it by about 100 yes. times. Yeah, which is uh, um, definitely not the intended effect. No, no. So it is, it is, I think the, the Y2K thing is a really relevant comparison because it, it does remind me of that quite a lot. And everyone was like, oh, my God. You know, Lucy, my wife, um, was working, I think, for Walker's Crisps in those days. Um, and um, she was paid, this is on, on like the 31st of uh, December, I think she was paid like triple or quadruple time to be on call because they thought their systems were going to fall over. Yeah, And, of course, you know, Absolutely nothing happened. Um, so she got a nice big windfall for that. And I, I think something similar is going to happen here. I mean, I, I did, what did I, what I see the other day? The ICO, the Information Commissioner's Office over here, was just basically basically saying um, that this is it's kind of, you know, it's best practice. It's, you know, we, we, we're not, again, this is, this is apocryphal. I can't remember where I read this, but something along the lines of they're not going to be going after people. It's really just, if you, if you try to do the right thing, that's really what they want. Yeah. Um, but it is it's leading to a lot of confusion where I'm getting, there's one um, one of our subscribers in particular, I think you've seen these messages, James. She has been bombarding me with... 20, um, 25 point questions on the detail of what she should no, be doing. And, and I can't really, you right. know, and in fact, and, and almost being critical of the podcast that we put out saying that we got it wrong. And yeah, maybe we did get it wrong. We may have got some bits wrong, but then everyone is getting a lot of it wrong. Yeah. Um, all, I think all, all we're doing is just trying to plot the safest courses we see at best practice, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and, right. and, and as we a, learn more, we'll, we'll, we'll pass more on. Yeah, uh, as things settle down. It's important to remember that there are people out there who will buy a CD or these days a download of 2 million email addresses and then they'll send an email out for a little widget that they're having built in China to everyone. They are the people who yeah. the ICO in the UK and the equivalent bodies around the world want to go after and say, you have nowhere near complied with this organisation, with this uh, legislation, and shut them down as best they can because they'll probably be in a country that's out of reach. But uh, for people who are doing everything they can to be compliant, and as I think Kevin Partners made this point endlessly, as you have, 
on on Facebook. Just let people know they're signing up to your list. Don't get really bogged down in um, they've got to absolutely sign this box, you know. And if they haven't signed the box, perhaps I should go around with a bit of paper and get them to sign a, a letter to me. Um, just make it clear to them that they're signing up to your list. Yeah, exactly. And it, yeah, it is. It's just. It's just funny. Some of the things that you've seen. And just before we wrap up on GDPR, I've seen some um, posts from authors that I, I think generally know what they're talking about, but some rants actually about um, about the EU being a totalitarian oh, government. Yeah. These, these are American authors who are like, how dare they? What, what are they going to do? And apart from the fact that that they can, it's very very simple for um, the EU to attach. Um, a judgment to uh, EU-based earnings. So anything anything authors make from the UK, well, perhaps not for too much longer, but um, a- anywhere you know it, within the EU, it would be quite easy for um, the uh, for those earnings to be effectively gobbled up. Um, but yeah, to you know, to compare it with totalitarianism, when really what the it's an annoying law um, because no one we, we're all a bit confused by it and it's kind of everyone has been take, taken slightly by surprise give, even though it's been on the cards for years but just think about as you say what they're trying to do is to make make it more um, more simple to go after people who buy those lists and and spam you when there's no question that you you haven't consented they're not re- this isn't going after people like us um, no. you generally speaking there of course there are exceptions but generally speaking Authors are just trying to, you know, to do the right thing, add people to their list when it's fairly obvious that that's what's happening. You know, we're not really the target here. It, yeah. It's those more egregious offenders that, that you mentioned. Uh, and you touched a little bit on Brexit there on, on the position. Obviously, that's a year or so away now uh, from the... And then there's going to be a handover period. I can't remember what that is. Another year, maybe two years? Ten, ten years. <laughs> who knows and the reason we haven't really talked about that is because guess what we don't really know no one in the uk or eu has really um sorted out a lot of the details there we are clearly going to stay in compliance with large chunks of uh of eu star legislation whether that's aviation air traffic control or gdpr what precisely that looks like or feels like we just don't know at the moment so we'll uh, we'll watch that with uh, the same interest that everybody else does in a year's time Okay, good. Well, excellent. A really good uh, round up. Well, you got your scissors again. You've, you've been, scissors, so we had yeah. a conference call this morning and Mark was waving these scissors at us and we thought it's either self-harming or threatening, one of the two. Yeah. And now you're sniffing right. pens. Um, yeah, before we wrap up, we really... So what, this episode goes out on Friday the 25th. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the, the reason we, we recorded this now is because obviously we, we're getting around to the point where we, um, we're putting the final touches on, on ads for authors, which releases for the sixth time. Um, and the date for that is, Mr. Black? June the 6th, which is uh, D-Day, the anniversary of D-Day, June the 6th. Oh, yeah, that's appropriate. It was going to um, be June the 5th, 1944, but the weather was bad, so it was June the 6th. A little bit of history. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so that's June the 6th. So that was two weeks from the date of um, this going out, isn't it, pretty much? Yes, about that, yeah. Yeah, about two weeks. So I think it's a Wednesday. So, um, yeah, just a, a, a date for your diary. We get plenty of people asking, uh, fact, all the time people asking when the course is going to be open again. So there, there's the answer. Um, and obviously Facebook is still an important part of the course. Uh, it used to be Facebook ads for authors. We've, it's much bigger than that now. Um, um, Facebook is still a very important part of my advertising platform, as we, as we touched on up at the up at the the start of things there. Um, Amazon ads is, I would say, an equally important part of the platform now. And um, one of the things that I'm, I'm going to be doing in the in the next two weeks, if I can find the time, is to re-record all of the content on the um, Amazon ads part of the course, just to bring, into, bring it up to date with some of the things that I do now that I, I didn't do then. So I do a lot more product display ads. I do a lot of automatic keyword um, ads. These are you know, generally very effective, make, make a good bit of money. Um, and um, advertising in the UK. There's ways to do that now. So we'll be recording a lot of new stuff. Um, all previous students will get all that for free, as, as is always the case with our new stuff. But it's just something that I want people to know that if you're interested in the course, um, it's more than just Facebook. Facebook is still important, but there's much more in the course. And you better see it on the 6th when when we're ready with the, the details and everyone will know about that as soon as we push the button. Yeah, and uh, we're going to add, we usually add a module uh, at the point of release, and this time it will be Pinterest, so Pinterest for authors. And we've been following this. We've been really talking about this over the last year and doing some experiments. And Pinterest does have an ads platform, and I've been experimenting with that. But we know 
uh, that the organic reach you can get on Pinterest. And think of Pinterest as being where Facebook was five years ago. It is a fertile time for organic reach. And Pip Reed, who's based in New Zealand at the moment, uh, has, I think she did give me her figures. I'm not necessarily going to quote them on air because I'm not sure how widely she shares them, but they do thousands of dollars of revenue a month and uh, knocking on 80% of their traffic is driven from Pinterest because she has really nailed it. So Pip Reed is going to be a guest uh, author, a lecture for us, and she's going to do the Pinterest for authors. So we've seen the, um, uh, I've sent you the curriculum. We've been through that together, Mark, and it looks really good, doesn't it? Yeah, you've just, weirdly, James, you might be able to hear this. You've just triggered Alexa. Oh, have I? And what? she's singing to me. Hang on, let me move the microphone. That's very weird. Alexa, what? stop. What did I uh, ask her she to was, do? I don't know, but she's singing to me in French. So I, um, I think Alexa's got a bit of a thing for me. She sings to me quite often. She also interrupts conversations quite a lot. <laughs> I, I, I shouldn't, I'm not going to use the A word because we'll trigger people's um, devices around the world, but um, I'm a big fan. I've actually got seven of them in the house now. Um, and it is great to be able to, it's just great. I'm not going to show off some of the things that we yeah. do, but we've well, got good. things like robot vacuum cleaners. Oh, and I can um, tell the robot vacuum cleaners to start cleaning just by <laughs> Telling them to do it. It's, we li yeah, living crazy. in the future, yeah. I use it for light, so I uh, it's great for me because the office is in the garden, particularly at night, and I walk from the house and tell A to uh, turn the lights on before I get here. And then if I've forgotten to turn them off and I've locked up, I can tell her she turns them off. So, I uh, yeah, we're fans, fans of the tech. Good. Okay, so all that's uh, coming up in the future. We'll have a lot more on ads for authors, and it gives us an opportunity, of course, to talk in more detail about advertising nearer the time. Uh, but June the 6th is date for your diary, and we are, as you say, getting emails at the moment asking us when it's open again, so it's going to be open then. And I can also tell you that we are not going to raise the price, despite the fact I think there's going to be eight separate courses now bundled into what was originally just one course on Facebook advertising. Um, and the price remains the same as it has done since March 2017. So doing everything we can to make it as good a value. And uh, there are plenty of people who will tell you that after they've taken it, they very quickly made their money back on that. So um, it's all about that. This is not a fluffy course with no discernible, tangible, measuring benefits this is a course with very tangible measurable benefits um but yeah more about that later mark thank you very much indeed thank you for putting up with the uh, traffic uh, racing to the scene of another chemical incident no doubt in uh, salisbury and we will we, Jim, we did the whole episode without mentioning the royal wedding oh no, i mentioned it oh dear yes we did yes um i was i was in the cathedral with my children watching on a big screen and um yeah people were applauding when the vows were exchanged it was all very strange but it was beautiful i thought it was beautiful and i did think uh if not well if not if nothing else but on top of it being a beautiful uh celebration of love which i thought was nice what an advert for the united kingdom it was blue skies castles princesses i mean it made me want to visit britain yeah it's always like that yeah, every day. Good. Every day. Come and visit Britain. Oh, yes. I will actually just throw in one thing because that's coming up soon as well. We are going to be in New York next month, month two after, months. two months in, in mid July. <clears throat> so we're going to be there from about Tuesday, the 10th of July uh, through to the Sunday on the 15th, whenever that is. Um, we're going to be attending Thriller Fest, but we will have a drinks reception in New York City, a uh, venue to be decided. But if you can put a date in your diary, perhaps maybe something like the 8th. The top of my head that's the Wednesday night Mark and I will be there we may even have with us the much promised pins we've promised these in the past look at that isn't that a... oh it's that's not upside... no it's upside down yeah <laughs> <laughs> I'd never make a blue Peter presenter there we go that's there our focus go. They're beautiful. They look like Star Trek emblems. And we'll be handing these out uh, to people who, uh, who pitch up and say hello to us in New York. So uh, hopefully you can uh, come along then. Good. That is it. Thank you very much indeed uh, for listening for this week. I uh, hope you enjoyed it and got some value out of it as always. And I hope you have a great week writing and a great week selling. Goodbye. You've been listening to the Self-Publishing Formula podcast. Visit us at selfpublishingformula.com for more information, show notes, and links on today's topics. You can also sign up for our free video series on using Facebook ads to grow your mailing list. If you've enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time.